And then for my own uh, reasons, reasons that I felt led to do, we uh, went off on a bit of a tangent, which was to show because there seems to be differences in the accounts in here and in, uh, math, in uh, Mark's and, and Luke's Gospel, that it was, I felt, worthwhile to look at those things. And so we looked at some of the um, difficulties that we have when we read an English translation of the Scriptures. And I hope that uh, some of those things made um, since sense to you if uh, they hadn't done so already. But one of the things we were left with last time, in looking uh, at a different example with Legion, one of the things we were, um, that came out from that is that the different writers, the different gospel writers, they complement one another, and in a sense they're bringing the truth as it's been revealed to them or as they've seen it. The Holy Spirit overseeing all, so that what they write is accurate and true. But when we have the different accounts, we often get uh, perhaps a more full account, as it were, through reading around, a fuller account. And so here, um, if you compare this with Matthew, with Mark and Luke, we have the full account, as it were. In the other two Gospels, he calls Jesus good. He comes up to him, runs up, falls on his knees in, in Mark's account, and he calls Jesus a good teacher. Someone who, therefore, must have eternal life. Good teacher. What must I do to get the same? What must I do to get eternal life? He puts Jesus on a pedestal by coming up and giving him this title. Good teacher. Excellent one. Splendid teacher. Putting him on a pedestal. When we read Matthew's account, what good thing must I do? What is he doing? What is he bringing out? He's showing us that this young man is saying, you're a good person, you're heaven bound, I want to join you, I want to join you. What good thing must I do to be like you, so that I can join you and have this hope of heaven? In the full conversation, I want to be good like you are, and I want to get eternal life. What have I got to do? You've obviously got to heaven. You've obviously got this hope of heaven. Good teacher. Because you are just that. You're a good teacher. You've taught people and you can see the, I can see the crowds that come to you. And so obviously through these things you've earned your way, your place in heaven. And, and me. What, what do I need to do? What sort of things should I do so that I can have the same hope that you've clearly got in your heart? And that kind of outlook is the outlook of many people down through the ages to look at Jesus as being a good teacher. One who sets a good example. One who by his life and by his teaching shows us how we should live. Follow him. Do the same thing. Live as best you can his teachings. Ah, and then you can be like him having the hope of eternal life. That's the kind of way many people look at um, passages in scripture where Jesus is teaching or the way people look at Jesus overall as someone who was a good teacher and who came to set a good example and we can follow that and we too can have the hope of eternal life. Here's a man who's upright, he's rich, he's young. Most people would reckon that um, he's, well it says he's a ruler, he's a young ruler, that he's probably someone who is a Pharisee and is a ruler in the synagogue. In, in, in sort of religious matters or maybe in civil matters, but the two are kind of intertwined, that he's a leading young Pharisee. Kind of got the world at his feet. What does he expect Jesus to say to him? Clearly there's something amiss, despite all the things that this young man seems to be and seems to have. He doesn't have peace, does he? And so he comes up to Jesus and asks him, how can I get there? And he expects Jesus perhaps to say, ah, oh, well, I'm a young man with great wealth like you, in a position like you. You ought to start a great project. Call it the so-and-so foundation. And after you've gone, your name will live on. That's what many people like to do, isn't it? Set things up in their name. Nothing wrong with doing that, of course. Except in if you think that by doing some such thing like that, that God is best pleased with you, and you will have eternal life. Jesus' answer to his question, 
reveals, perhaps if the young man doesn't see it clearly, we can, reveals the inability of him being able to keep the law. And he also shows that it's faith, not works, but faith alone that saves. And so firstly what I'd like to draw out from this is the inability of works. By that, you know what I mean, the things that you do, the good deeds that you do, the good things that you store up, as it were, are not sufficient to get you a place in heaven. The inability of works, doing things in order that God would be pleased with you. And yet, having said that, that Jesus reveals his inability to keep the law, the inability of works... Some would say, and indeed I raised this question the very first time we looked at this, in verse 17 at the end there, that Jesus actually appears to be advocating works. Because in Jesus' answer, second part of his answer if you like, he says, if you want to enter heaven, obey the commandments. The young man asks what once. Jesus then tells him certain things that he should keep of the Ten Commandments, from the Ten Commandments. And then he says, I've kept all these. Now you would think, and if I'm in the precinct and someone said, I'm a good person, my natural reaction is to say, ah, have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah, we all have you. What does that make you then? You know, and, and to kind of use the law in that way, that's, that's how many of us would, would want to do it. When someone claims to be a good person, when someone claims to have kept the law, what do we tend to want to do? We want to thunder the law at them. We want to be Moses with the law and smash the two tablets between their ears, as it were. Rend them unconscious. That's what we like to do, isn't it? To show them, you haven't done this! But Jesus doesn't. Jesus, when he says, what do I still lack? I've kept all these. He tells him to, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Doesn't he appear to be advocating works here? What I want to try and show is that Jesus is actually doing quite the opposite of that. That he's using the law... In a different way to perhaps what you and I might do as we bash the person between the ears. He's using the law to show the man's sin. Which of course is the purpose of the law. But he's using it in a very wonderful way. He shows, in the first instance, his failure... To keep those first set of commandments. You know, we often call them the first tablet. If you imagine the Lord giving Moses the two stone tablets. Ten commandments. Four that are directed. Well they're all directed towards the Lord of course. But their four are directed specifically towards the, the Lord. The first four. And then the latter six are towards our dealings with one another. Our interactions with people. Jesus shows his failure to keep those first commandments. That's the first thing he does. He challenges him, in verse 17, about this whole matter of goodness. Good teacher, what good thing? The rich man needed, what the rich man felt he needed, was for God to see that he was good. And in the full conversation, the fullness of it, Jesus asks two questions. Why do you call me good? Why do you ask me about being good? In other words, as he says, can anyone be good before God? Is it possible? The Bible tells us that there is no one who is good. And yet this young Pharisee who surely must know the law, surely must be schooled in the scriptures, comes up and calls Jesus good, talks about being good. And yet the Bible says there's no one good. Why is there no one good? Well, has he forgotten what happened right at the start? Has he forgotten the fall? Has he forgotten about Adam and Eve? That when they fell, 
They lost that original goodness, their original righteousness. They lost it. And since then, there has been no one who is good. Because we are all born ungood. Not good. We are all born bad. Turn to the Psalms. Turn to Psalm 14. You know, these, often we quote it from Romans. It is quoted in Romans. But in Psalm 14, is the young man a fool? Because it tells us in Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. I know I've, I've read that wrong because it's the fool who says there is no God. But then end of quote, now the psalmist David writing, they are corrupt, such a person. Their deeds are vile, such people. But then there is no one who does good. And then it goes on, the Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. And then Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20. There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. There's not one. Not a righteous man on earth. Isn't that pitiful? Not one. Ecclesiastes 7.20 No one who does good. Yet, this Pharisee, young ruler, who should know better, comes up to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what good thing can I do so that I can be good like you? There's no one who does good. No one. We are all spiritually bankrupt. Trouble with the Pharisees, as you know, is that they mistakenly thought that the law made them good. That they, perhaps, I don't know, if they lost the fact that they were not good at the start, lost the uh, sight of the fall, but certainly they believed that through the law, they could become good and impress God. When we first looked at this, I drew you back to the verses before the little children and Jesus. We spent some time looking at that. And one of the things that I pointed out there was this young man doesn't come as a little child. He comes in his great strength of his riches, his wealth, his position, his power. And says, you know, ah, what about me? Forgetting, if indeed he heard him, what Jesus says. That a little child is someone who comes with a childlike dependency. A child is dependent upon its parent. Someone who comes and says, Lord... Lord, I have nothing. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. And that is the approach that this young man should have. But no, this young man, he feels he's getting there. He may not want to call himself good yet, but he can call Jesus good. And he wants to be good like him. The law was never meant to save us. The law is a schoolmaster. Keeping the law is impossible. Keeping the law will not save. It's a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The correct way for the Jewish people to operate in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant as it were, the correct way for them to operate was to, by faith in God, follow the law. God has given. Faith comes first. Not the law to save you and then something else happens or whatever, but it's faith. And then you follow the law. And it's the same for someone when they become a Christian. A person who becomes a Christian, the law convicts us of our sin, we turn to Christ. We're saved. And then we go back to the law, in a sense, to guide us as to how we ought to live. Not in a legalistic way, but the law guides us as to living, our Christian living, but always it's by grace. So, there is no one who's good, but also, Jesus then goes on to say, why do you give me a title that is only for God? Now you have to bring the other accounts in here, don't you, the Mark and Luke, where 
good teacher. Why are you calling me good? Why do you give me a title? The title of good in that respect is one that should only be for God. Why are you giving me that title? Here's a young man who's using flattery, it would seem. He's on his knees. In a sense, Jesus is saying, should you do that before anyone? Should you fall on your knees before anyone? And perhaps, in the man's flattery, it's a reminder of how people conduct themselves today. We talked about this recently, about superlatives and how people throw in superlatives in things so easily. If I watch some football or you, and you listen to a, a commentator afterwards, one of the so-called experts, the superlatives, they just, they come off the, 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 the tongue so easily. Every sentence seems to have one in. Every person they talk about. Greatest ever and this kind of thing. Is this what this man is doing here? Coming with a flattery. Has he thought about what he's saying? Good teacher. On his knees. Is he not guilty of what many of our modern people are guilty of in that way? Of using language too lightly. Because at the end of the day, effectively what Jesus is saying, why do you call me good? Is this, the greatest of men are but men. And even those who we would look at, and perhaps we might say are worthy of our superlatives. The abilities they've got are gifts from God. The enabling for them to do, to carry out those gifts, to use those gifts, is God's enabling. Just as I can look and see the, whatever it's called at the back of the room there, hostess trolley. God gives me the sight, the ability to be able to see it. The fact that I see it as brown or black or blue or whatever is, is God's enabling, isn't it? And so, one of the questions that came up before, the first time we looked at it, and indeed, when Jesus says, if you want to enter into life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. And Jesus says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, etc. The question I raised before, and I raise it again now. Why does Jesus not mention the first tablet? Why does he not mention, you shall have no other gods before me? Why does he not say that? He says at the end, love your neighbour as yourself, which is the second great commandment. Why doesn't he say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength? And love your neighbour as yourself. Why leave off the first tablet? The answer is simple. Jesus has just shown this young man he's failed to keep them. Because he's given Jesus a title that should only be for God. So he's blasphemed. Giving Jesus reverence that is only due to God. Therefore, he's broken the first set of commandments. He doesn't see it though, does he? Doesn't appear to see it. And so, Jesus goes on then to show him his failure to keep the second set of commandments. He lists them, and then you read in verse 20, All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? And Jesus shows him now his failure to keep those. He says he's kept them, as many people would do. Jesus now shows you haven't. He says this in verse 21. If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. In other words, what Jesus is saying to this young man who says, I've kept all those commandments. Jesus is saying, have you really? Have you really? What was the last one I mentioned? Love your neighbour as yourself. Who do you love more? Your neighbour or your possessions, young man? Which is it? Which is more important to you? 
It's one of those dramatic moments in a person's life. It's an Abraham moment. There's Abraham. God comes to him and says, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, Lord. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go and sacrifice him at a place and I will show you. That's a dramatic moment, isn't it? It's a life-changing moment. And that's what Jesus puts before this young man now. Will he take the opportunity? Will his life be changed? Or will he go back and stay in his old world without the peace that only Christ can bring? Sometimes when the Lord issues that kind of Abrahamic challenge, sometimes just as with Abraham, it's not something that has to be carried out. It's that the Lord wants you to see or to bring you to that point where you decide as it were the willingness to sacrifice Isaac is what the Lord wants Abraham to come to and oftentimes when the Lord calls us to something dramatic like that it's for us to do the same to show the willingness but if we are willing if we're willing then the richest gain we get, don't we, from doing so. Sadly and tragically, it's too much for this young Jew. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. The young man won't obey after all. Many people would say, I'm a good person. Perhaps they wouldn't today when many people are saying there is no God and live in sort of a semi-atheistic society. But you and I know that deep down, all people know there is a God. All people know that. It's written on their heart. We suppress the truth. People suppress the truth through evolution and all sorts of other teachings. By the way, just on that. I know I've said it before, but I feel like saying it again. Don't ever think that you've got to convince someone of creation before you can talk to them about Christ. Just talk to them about Christ. Because it's the power of the Holy Spirit that will awaken what has been suppressed right down. You don't need to. Sometimes, yes, of course, it's worthwhile talking about creation. There are those who do it really well. But you and I, we don't need to worry about that. Just proclaim the truth. And let God work by his Holy Spirit. But there are people today who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a bad person. And whether you do what I said, get the commandments and you bash them over the head with them or whatever. If you do something like that, or even what we've seen Jesus do here in, in a very um, clever way in a sense. Show this young man that he's broken the first set of commandments. Show him that he's broken the second set of commandments or that he's not willing to keep them, let's say. The young man, whether he sees it or not, he won't pay the price of sacrificing everything and then following Christ. He won't do it. It's too high a price. Many people would say when you you start to uh, show them the standard of the law, the standard that's required, the things that must go from their lives. Many people would say, well, that's, that's too high, that's too harsh. I'm not having that, I'm not interested in that. What about you? You're the one telling me all this. You don't seem to live like that, you don't seem to keep those things. You're a hypocrite. That's what you are. And if you and I are being honest, we'd be the first to agree, I know. So often I'm a hypocrite. And you and I know as well that the law can never save us. You and I know that the law is the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And it's what we use perhaps to try to show someone their sin. But we would never raise our hands and say, I keep the law perfectly. We would raise our hands and say, I can't keep the law perfectly. But I know a man who can has kept it for me. And that's the point, isn't it? That's the key. So to sum up this young man, 
comes up to Jesus, not like the little child who sees his need or his dependency upon the Lord, but comes up and says, here I am with my riches, with my wealth. But I don't have peace. I don't have certainty. And I want to know that peace. I want to have a peace. So we can say there's a sincere man there. We can recognise that uh, seeking in his heart. But then when Jesus tells him the price he must pay for that peace, he goes away sad because the price is too much. It's too high for him to pay. And so... We would often say, wouldn't we, at this point, riches, riches, cloud his eyes to the sight of Christ and his majesty, to the sight of heaven and his glory. Riches are like, uh, I don't know, trinkets dangled before a child's eyes in a sense. You know, there's a baby perhaps and the baby can't talk yet apart from make a few guggling noises and crying. That kind of thing you Something glittering, something bright before their eyes, and their eyes are fixed on him. This poor man, this young man, is like that, isn't he? His eyes are on his riches, and it's going to be taken from him. Jesus says, let it be taken from you. And he says, no, he won't have that. He won't have that. And so, an application there is to say, as Jesus goes on to say, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And to say, what is it if there's anyone here who isn't a Christian? Why are you not a Christian? What riches are scaling your eyes so you don't see the truth? What is it in your life that is so valuable as to keep Christ out? What is it that you would have more than the Lord Jesus? Well, that's an application, but there's more. Because here's a rich man who is a ruler. He's got health, wealth and power position, hasn't he? And in the eyes of well, people today as much as people of those days. But let's think of people of those days. In the eyes of people of those days, here is a man who is eminent. He is preeminent in a sense. He's one of the forerunners of society. He's one of the very people in the vanguard of things. And surely here is a man who can use his wealth to gain heaven. Here is a man who has position to be seen in using that position to build the so-and-so foundation. To be seen as someone who could ultimately have the title he's given to Jesus. Good. Good. And the Jewish society would look on such a one and say, just as for any Pharisee, schooled in the law, they're the ones who will be at the front. They're the ones who will be nearest the throne of God. And yet what did Jesus say of the Pharisees? He said, unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees' righteousness, you can forget all about heaven. In other words... You've got to be better. You've got to be better. And of course that leads you to the point, the inability of works, the inability of the law. You cannot be better than a Pharisee, and even if you can, it's not good enough. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. In saying this, Jesus turns the thinking on its head. Rich men, religious men, men of power like that, they'll have a place in heaven. Jesus turns all that on its head. You know how you um, are good at threading needles with cotton when I was probably a bit older than Abby but younger than Matt my gran and my grandma whenever I was with them and they needed they seemed to always do, be doing sewing I don't know if your grandparents did this but when I was a child they seemed to do it every day but I was always the one who had to thread the needle with the cotton with the thread 
And uh, I was always told, you've got a good eye. I don't think I have any more. <laughs> Last few times I've tried it, it's been quite a struggle. I'm sure the needles are getting smaller. I think that's what it is. <laughs> but it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to thread a needle. It's not hard to get a camel through the eye of a needle. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Jesus is stating an impossibility. It is not something you might read in children's books. That, oh, there was a um, uh, certain gates there called the Needles in Jerusalem, and you know it was hard to get a camel through. We had a book that we threw away for our, our boys, and it had this man, and he had to take all the furniture off the camel, as it were, and get it through like that. It was really hard. And there's no archaeological evidence of there ever being such a narrow gateway. There's no evidence for that. And even if there was, it doesn't matter. The point is this. It's an impossibility. That is what it's Jesus is saying. It's impossible for a rich man to enter heaven through his works, through his wealth, position, power. Now, what Jesus is saying is something absolutely astounding. Because he's not just saying, look, it's riches that stop him. The people would look at the rich people and say, they will be the ones at the front. They're the first into heaven. Now they're realising, if they listen to what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, they won't be in there. Well, hang on. Hang on, if they're not going to be in there, what about us who are lower down? Now the disciples missed many things. Until Pentecost, until the Holy Spirit came. But they saw this one, all right? Listen to them. When the disciples, verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? They've seen it. If rich people like him, who have position, who are religious, if they cannot get into heaven, who can? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Works cannot save. God alone saves. For the disciples, this is what I would call a high jump. There you are, you're competing in the Olympics. Don't you even know, but the, as I understand it, the world record for high jump is 2.45 metres, which is, I think, just over 8 feet, which is pretty high, really, isn't it? It's incredible. 2.45 metres. You've jumped 2.43. There's you and one other person left. It's put up to 2.46. The other person jumps 2.46. But then crashes out and says, I can do no more. You do 2.46. Now, it's going to be a draw. Unless you can do one more. You come up. And what is the bar at? The bar is not at 2.45 metres. Someone's raised it to 6 metres. That's almost 20 feet. I think it's probably more, actually. Either that or the 8 feet one is wrong, but whatever. 6 metres is what you've now got to jump. Well, that's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. It cannot be done. Even, I don't know if they do 6 metres, maybe they do with the uh, what's it thingy, you know, the pole, but you've got to be careful with that. They snap sometimes, don't they? <laughs> it's impossible. It is impossible for a human being without some uh, extra help, as it were. Don't know what, but some sort of help. It's impossible for them to jump six metres. It never will be. It never will happen. Even if they eat three shredded wheat and have all their whatever you have and all that sort of stuff, it's impossible. And this is a high jump moment for the disciples. They believe that being with Jesus, here is someone who can jump 2.45, probably 2.46 as it were. He's a good teacher. And following him like they are, surely, you know, they'll be able to sort of edge in behind that rich man. 
And Jesus says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You can see it in Peter's face as he answers, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? We've, we've given all. We've left everything. Well, won't that save us? We don't have the great riches of this young man, but, but surely giving everything you, you, you said to him, won't that save us? We have to say, as Jesus says in that verse, salvation is only possible through divine grace, through divine intervention. Grace alone, isn't it? So the inability of works. But then we go on to see, secondly, that faith alone saves. Back to verse 16. A man comes up to Jesus. He comes running up. He falls on his knees. He says, good teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, think about that. Although I've said he's using flattery and his superlatives come too easily, at the same time, there's, there's another side to this. That, in a sense, it's not easy for a Pharisee to say such things. Because in coming to Jesus in the way he is, in a public way, he runs the risk of being derided by his peers. He runs the risk of being ridiculed, doesn't he? But he does it. He comes to Jesus. So we have to say that though there is an element of flattery there and he's guilty of superlatives, using superlatives to perhaps easily, at the same time you have to say that he has respect for Jesus and that he's very sincere but Jesus takes this man good teacher what good thing must I do to get eternal life why do you call me good and why do you ask about what is good in other words what I want to point out is that Jesus, not only is he showing him his failure to keep those first set of commands, and of course the second set is what comes after, not only is he doing that, but he's also putting a question. You call me good teacher. Who do you think I am? Who is it that stands before you? You've given me a title. That should only be given to God. Is that how you see me? Is that how I appear to you standing before you? He wants him to think on who it is that is before him. And it's something we should all think on, isn't it? Who is Jesus? Who is he? There's a challenge. Who do you think I am? And then in verse 21, when he says, sell everything, then come and follow me, I would suggest he's adding to that challenge. Who do you think I am? Who do you think he is? That he could say, sell everything, and then follow me. Basically, give up your life and become my disciple. Who would say such a thing? He's adding to the challenge. You call me good. That was a big step for a Pharisee to take. You're seeking to be like me. You say you've kept the commandments. But what do you really need? What you really need, young man, is to sell all and follow me. Turn away from the things of this world. Turn away from the so-and-so foundation. Turn away from such things. Turn to me. Follow me. Now why did Jesus say that? Why would anyone say that? Unless the one saying it is issuing another challenge. I am all those things. The one before you is not just a mere man. The things that you, the titles that you use, perhaps flippantly, they do apply to me. Unless Jesus is a madman, would he say such things? Would he say such things? In other words, you cannot be good like me. You cannot do it. You cannot be good like me.
But you can have faith in me. Giving up everything doesn't save you. Following the Lord Jesus Christ does. Giving up is an action. It's an action of repentance, isn't it? Following is an action of faith. Have you committed the act? Have you committed the act of repentance? Have you committed the action of faith? Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned from the things of this world? Have they grown strangely dim? Have you turned to Christ? In newness of life. And with eyes that see him. Faith. Why does he go away sad? Why does this young man go away sad? Because of this. He will have Jesus as a teacher. Might drop the title good because I'm not sure that that's a good thing now to say. But he'll have Jesus as a teacher. He'll follow Jesus as a teacher. But not at that price. It's too dear. It's too much to pay. Jesus is good, but he ain't that good as far as this young man is concerned. Now why would he do that? The only reason he would do that is because of this. He has not seen who it is who is before him. He has not seen who Jesus really is. He's missed the challenge, or even if he's seen the challenge, he hasn't accepted it. He hasn't accepted these things in his heart. In his heart, his eyes are still covered. The scales have not come away. Remember the scales fell from Paul's eyes, didn't they? Why would anyone give up wealth? Why would anyone give up their position? Why would anyone do such a thing? The person who would is the person who sees that he is those things. That he is that good. They can do it. Have you done it? preempt because my final thing is to put a challenge to you. What about you? What about you? What about us? Who is Jesus? That's the question, isn't it? Who is he? Who is he to you? When I worked in butchery, they used to use a, we came from London, butcher's backslang. And if someone saw an attractive Young lady, they would say, I bet you call the Elric. Which meant, have a look at the girl. I bet you call is meant to be have a look backwards, but I don't know where you get the chip big in it, because it's have a call, it would be have a look backwards. But there we are. That's what they used to use. I bet you call. Have a look. Have a look. Have a look at what? Have a look at your heart. Have a look at your heart. Ask yourself, have I really seen him? And if you say, I think I have. I think I have. Where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? The evidence is not in putting yourself under these commands, as it were, and trying to lift them up and keep them. That's not the evidence. The evidence is saying, by grace I've been set free from all this. By grace I'm in newness of life. By grace, I see who Jesus Christ really is. And he is more than all the world to me, as a consequence. If your heart is still for this world, and only you know your heart, well, sometimes we don't know our heart that well, do we? But we have to do some examining here. We have to be kind of doctors, as it were, of our hearts. If your heart is still on this world then you've not seen him you have not seen him if your heart is clinging to this world you have not seen Jesus you have not seen who he really is let me put another challenge what have you ever given up for him what have you done what have you given up for him What were you willing to give up for him? What are you willing to give up for him now? 
Is he that important? Have you really seen him? What about that thing? What about that one thing that's so vital to you? Would you give it up for him? Would you really? you've not seen him, you must keep looking. Keep looking. Keep looking at Jesus until you see him as he is. You say, well, it's it's too cryptic. And in fact, what you brought out here, you know, I can see where you're going, but it's very cryptic, isn't it? It's not really. It's not really. Let me tell you straight. Jesus Christ is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He's the Son of God. That's all there is to it. Do you see it? Do you see it? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now, if you see that, if you see who he is, that he, not just, I want Jesus because I want to get to the Father. Jesus is more than just a mediator, the good one, as it were, who, who opens the door and says, come on, come on, come through me, trample all over me, all over my blood that I shed for you. Don't worry about all that. Get to the fact that it's more than that. It's more than that. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That says it all, really, doesn't it? The way, the truth, and the life. It's not go through Jesus to get beyond Jesus. It's go to Jesus, to remain with Jesus, who is the life and light of your soul. We speak about a parable that Jesus told about a pearl, a man finding a pearl that was of great value to him. What did he do? He sold everything in order to have that one pearl. Now, in the parable, it's talking about so will, do, so will do the person who sees the kingdom of heaven. That's what they will do. Who sees that in Jesus is the kingdom of heaven. They'll sell everything to have that pearl. So that they can have heaven. But a heaven without Christ is no heaven at all. Because it's Christ who makes heaven. Many great and godly men who have gone before us have said, I would rather hell with Christ than heaven without him. Can you say that? Is your idea of wanting heaven just because you want heaven and you want a nice feeling and you want peace from all the troubles you've had now? The warfare of life, as it were. You want that to cease and you want to have peace. And so you want heaven. Or is it that you want heaven because that's where Christ is and you want to be with him? Who is King of Kings? Who is Lord of Lords? Who is the Son of God? Now that's faith. Faith, when it sees Jesus will have no other and will be willing to give up all else for him. Jesus says, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. So, though it may be that certain people have had to give up those things, and praise God, we don't always have to. But the willingness must be there. Those who've been willing inherit so much more. So much more. But let me say this, and just trying to draw it to a close now. Don't make the point, don't, don't get me wrong and think for one moment that I am saying, he's saved because he has faith. I'm not saying that for one moment, and I wouldn't say that, because to say that your faith saves you, it's a work again, isn't it? Just, all I've done is I've removed the law and I've put faith there instead. You need faith. Oh, I've got faith. Hey, I'm saved through what I've done. I'm better than him because I saw Jesus. I exercised my faith. I saw, and I thought, that's what I need to do. And he didn't. You know, he's, not, he's just thick. He's stupid. It's by grace that you are saved. Through faith. But by grace. The grace of God in shedding the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross, in him being hung up and crucified, and being willing to say, I will die for my people, for those whom the Father has given me, for those whom the Father loves. 
by grace you are saved. Through faith. Faith is, as it begins to blossom, is the offshoot of the work of God. It's impossible for man. What's impossible for man is possible for God. Of the work of God in bringing life to you. And when God brings life to you, faith is born. And as faith begins to grow, it blossoms. It blossoms and it puts a smile and a radiance on you. And it gives you a new demeanour. It gives you a new character. It gives you a new desire, new passions. But ultimately all those things are centred on Christ. On Christ alone. You say, as we all do, how we face temptations. When you're tempted... Are you ever tempted to lament what you've left? Doesn't mean if you've fallen into that where you've thought, oh, if only I could still do this or still have that. Doesn't mean that now you're not a Christian. It does mean this though, that you've backslidden. And it means that you've taken your eyes off Christ. Turn your eyes back on him. Look to him. If you're downcast, if the things of this world are really treading down on you, don't do what my grand said. Chin up. Chin up. That's what you'll do. Keep your chin up. It does make you feel a little bit better, actually, when you walk like that. But what you're to do is exactly the same thing. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Don't chin up. Look to Jesus. Look to him. Look to him. Listen to these words as I close. We'll sing this in a moment. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, My richest gain I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose? So rich a crown. His dying crimson, like a robe, spreads over his body on the tree. Then am I dead to all the globe, and all the globe is dead to me. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Has he got your soul? Have you seen him? Have you seen Jesus? Amen.